Hey everybody, I am very excited to announce the next summer edition of the Knowledge Graph Technology Showcase. This time around, we're going to have a little bit more fun. And so what we're going to do is we're going to focus on data visualization and not just one aspect of data visualization, but we're going to be looking from how do you model the data and gather the data and do things with the data, getting it into a database and also making visualizations that you can find information from, your end users can find valuable. And I find these data visualizations incredibly useful when talking to senior stakeholders. These are all going to be my honest reviews of these tools and services. So the technology that we're going to be reviewing today is, there we go. All right, so without further ado, let's go get started. And we are going to be talking about a very interesting knowledge graph uh, that is happening up in uh, Canada. And this is something that I think a lot of people can actually benefit from that are doing things either in cultural heritage or the arts in general, or anything that has to do with um, retaining that that knowledge of, of culture that people have. All right. So, so Gregory, do you want to introduce what are you guys all about? What are you doing over there? Sure. So yeah, my name is Gregory and I'm working with two great co-founders, uh, Caitlin and Tammy. And we're up here in Canada. Um, we're working uh, on a, our main project is called artsdata.ca. And that's a knowledge graph, as you're saying. And um, we're really trying to make it a communal knowledge graph uh, of what's happening in arts in Canada. So not only, like you mentioned, heritage, and that's a valuable part of the knowledge graph, but the main part of the knowledge graph is all about what's coming up in the next year. And as you know, it's very critical now more than ever uh, for people to easily find out what's happening in the arts. But it's really important to think of this project as a community data space, because without the community, there's no point. I mean, we're really trying to, as a group, work together, um, create resources, data resources for the sector, the arts sector in Canada. Mm -hmm. And so the community you know, needs to span both people providing data in, you know, whether you have a website and you have events and you want to get your data into the knowledge graph and also the people that are using that. Mm -hmm. So we see, you know, we call it a public utility in a sense because the project is a, a meant to be a public utility. Imagine a park or a library where people come and, and aggregate and, and congregate and can share um, information. The, the community is working together and it's not public yet. I can tell you a bit about the timeline, but um, we we do hope to have a more public launch uh, mid uh, 23. Yeah, no, that's exciting. But uh, you know, this was the the Great Library of Alexandria, right? It had amphitheaters in it. It had places for performing arts. It had places for people to um, debate philosophy. This has always been a huge part of knowledge, and so it's really cool that you're kind of like bringing it back old school super old school. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I have to really shout out to uh, participants in this community, like um, arts organizations like Capicoa, who has been fundamental in getting this ball rolling, uh, Crow's Theatre, who is also playing a pioneering role um, in Quebec here, Couture Laval, and players across Quebec and Canada, because it's really that community that makes yeah. this advance. We're, we're, we hope it to grow in all sorts of ways and get individuals involved, but currently, since we're still in beta, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the participants are official arts organizations mm -hmm. that are either, um, you know, either presenting uh, with websites that present artists or mm -hmm. uh, umbrella organizations that group together yeah. presenters across the country or, you know, um, are, have a vested interest in, in sharing data. Yeah. And, you know, software costs can be very expensive. So part of the idea here of making this a public utility is in the overall picture to reduce the cost of doing software projects yeah. and making these data resources readily available. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's about reuse of data. Why does everyone need to create their own CMS data silo? Uh, you know, if you want to present what an artist is doing, what events they're participating in, Mm -hmm. That should be easily reused, and that's the approach we're taking with arts data. And so is this uh, either part of, or is it planned to be a part of the linked open data cloud? Yeah, um, so the linked open data cloud, I, I think, um, is great in the sense that 
it's the direction that the web is going in. So we are all about linked open data and using W3C uh, and open standards so that uh, it's really not just uh, constrained to one uh, software stack. So it's mm -hmm. really to be standards based, yep. open data, yep. and uh, that's the goal. And mm -hmm. by having this data publicly available, we believe it can be reused more uh, by the community. Yeah, that's awesome. And so you've mentioned a little bit about what kind of data. So you've mentioned um, artists and what they're doing and websites. So tell us a little bit, like walk us through when somebody um, decides that they're going to be participating and working with you um, as a public utility, it's it's open and free. Uh, what kind of data are you looking at and how do they get involved in, in at least supplying the data at first? It's set up basically in a typical um, platform manner mm -hmm. with data providers on one side and data consumers on the other. So uh, data providers can be as simple as an arts organization website. Um, we also take data from databases. Uh, we've built a, a tool uh, called Footlight and there are other tools that are shared. And on the right, you have di different data consumers. Um, but the one thing I want to emphasize is the community aspect. So really, what we want to uh, see arts data ecosystem, it has a community, and we want to see it as a community data space. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about shared tools, well, um, Footlight is an example of a shared tool that, that we've built that helps a, really a person without any RDF skills mm. uh, to be able to take their website and contribute uh, a derived version of it to the knowledge graph. And so reuse is really important. Uh, you know, that's one of the main goals of creating this uh, knowledge graph. So uh, an example of reuse that we already do is if a, a website has uh, schema.org markup mm -hmm. for the events, mm -hmm. then we can, we can create another derived data set based on that website and uh, reuse that data already at the get-go. Um, yeah, and that's great. So is so schema.org is one of the most popular, um, but do you also support things like Dublin Core and some of the other metadata standards? If, as long as they're W3C, you should probably be able to handle it, right? Yeah, okay. So in the center, we have uh, the Arts Data CA platform, and um, so there are many parts to it. Um, there are many APIs, such as the Reconciliation API. If you have a bunch of artist names of strings uh, mm -hmm. or places or events, we can convert that to identifiers mm -hmm. uh, using the Reconciliation API in a very similar way that you could use uh, Wikidata to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to connect a, an identifier. Yeah. If there aren't identifiers, we have uh, an ID minting uh, API. Oh, nice. That's good. Yeah, so that, so that our goal is for the community to be able to create every Canadian artist, um, you know, or actor in the in the in the uh, industry, the, the cultural mm -hmm. industry and in sector in Canada. Mm -hmm. So really, uh, we want to be able to have as many artists as possible. Um, and is that reconciliation happening on those minted IDs? You would use reconciliation to understand that that's really the same person and not as assign another ID. Is that accurate? Exactly. You know, Perfect. in the end. In the end, the, the knowledge graph can have several IDs coming from different systems, but we do try and reconcile them to all point to the same IDs. Okay, great. That's great. Yeah, that from the get-go, we wanted this to be open, uh, based on standards. And, you know, it's exciting for me in, in terms of the technology, because there are many things like, you know, Hydra to describe APIs using RDF, you know, mm -hmm. things like that that are really still... Uh, in the works, but are, yeah. are are leading the way to, I think, a really uh, interesting uh, and and interchangeable future. What do you think about RDF Star? Is that something that you guys are are looking at at all? Yeah, I'm a big supporter of RDF Star. Um, I think that um, it can be used in certain situations where you want to add some metadata on top mm -hmm. of a, like a triple um, mm -hmm. without doing the whole reification. Oh, yeah. So. I think is extremely useful, and we've started to experiment with it. Okay. Um, we want to be careful that other systems can support, you yeah. know, the RDF star serializations. But um, really excited about RDF star. All right. Well, that's great because you are are doing an open ecosystem. I would also assume that you're 
perfectly happy to be collaborating and working with others that want to improve the system and work with you on the system. Is that accurate? Because it sounds like you're doing a lot of really cool stuff and those watching might want to, you know, find out how to get involved with you. Uh, definitely. I mean, part of the shared tools idea is that if, if someone wants to add a tool or contribute or, or, or change or improve a tool, then that's fantastic. We're right. a small team still. So, you know, we are still trying to build up, um, you know, our services so that we can even collaborate with more people. So yeah. there may just be a bottleneck, but in terms of desire, totally, we want to, we are already working with European uh, mm -hmm. uh, p people to try and connect heritage data to yeah. the future events so that the, um, the, the linked data can be even more impressive. All right, so Gregory, I know that you were also going to talk to us about the data model, which we're all excited about on this channel. So do you want to hop over to that? So we, we started with a core data model focused on events, and mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to include the related uh, information around people, places, and organizations. Um, so this is a very simple model. Um, it's mostly uh, schema.org, mm -hmm. um, but one of the big initiatives with CAPACOA's Linked Digital Future initiative mm -hmm. is on extending that and including more and more um, other ontologies, either mappings to Wikidata so mm -hmm. that we can merge uh, Wikidata data um, and specific vocabularies, RDA, or mm -hmm. uh, you know, following closely our LRMOO um, mm -hmm. to see how that progresses. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing to note is uh, because we're focused on we're, for performing arts, that's really the yeah. uh, starting point, uh, you know, trying to model, you know, sort of the, the, the non-commercial as well as the commercial uh, mm -hmm. performing arts. There are some controlled vocabularies that we're working on uh, yeah. that, you know, using SCOS can allow us to represent better the types of performing arts mm -hmm. and the roles, the roles yeah. of people uh, in those. And we think we have our hands full with that um, <laughs> to begin with. And then yeah. you know, we'll see, uh, based on the community, where the needs are to extend the model towards productions, towards offers in, in, the, in the marketplace of a, of a production so that it gets produced and, and, and goes on tour and things like that. Those are all exciting pieces to come. So is that taxonomy being developed with your organization? Is it something that you are um, collaborating with others? And how do you, this is always a question I have, I am a, a true believer in more folksonomic uh, taxonomies. However, they are incredibly difficult to maintain and manage. Uh, so how are you doing that, if you can share? Yeah, so this is still very much in development. Um, we, you know, our, our founder, Tammy Lee, uh, comes from the arts sector. So she is, can work uh, and really has the perspective from inside. So she's 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 um, a, a good uh, point of of congregation, if you will, mm -hmm. and gathering input from other community members and synthesizing that so that we can have something that is a controlled vocabulary. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, mapping that to different verticals. So if you're in ballet, you know you're going to call the same role something that uh, is actually called something else uh, if you're if you're doing a musical tour or. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in the opera. So mm -hmm. this is this is a, a an ongoing work, and I don't think there's yeah. any there's any one way to do it. But I think by having working with people who are from the sector uh, and then getting their language is is really yeah. key. I, and I'm so happy that you say that. Um, I'll put a card above because it's essentially what I talk about with equitable search, right? Which is essentially what you're talking about is. If you are familiar with ballet, but you know maybe you're searching um, in things that are dealing more with opera, you still want to be able to harness the language and the terminology that both of those groups use because they are equally important and valid. And so the, you ha that's why knowledge graph is so powerful. How do you handle um, time series, right? So some things are going to run a certain amount of time. How do you model that um, in graph? Because sometimes that can be tricky. It is. It is very tricky. And there's been introduction of all sorts of new concepts around time. Mm. Um, so we are we are using, you know, the traditional uh, start date, end date. Mm -hmm. um, basically, we have some flexibility where if it's a specific event on a specific day, um, the start date <clears throat> includes the time, which mm -hmm. is important. 
and the end date can be just the day, or it can be left open. Whereas if, if it's uh, something that is a series that's going over a longer span of time, then the start date and end date become more important. Mm -hmm. um, we also introduce sub events, which you can see in the model, um, mm -hmm. which is very important because often there may be a series of events described on a web page, and a lot of the uh, model is um, adapted to being able to model what's on a web page. So, you know, we, we often start with a web page and look at the events, and often it's helpful to have a main event, which often describes uh, the event, has some, some media images and uh, can can have some performer and organizer links and then have sub events which are individual things you can buy tickets for with individual offers for those events um, and the of course the place versus virtual location is really important yeah because, uh, that has shifted over the last year and now yeah. you know a location can be a place but it also can be a zoom link or you know a link to yeah. a, a Facebook Live. So attendance mode. So the, the other two that are important that are that are called out here is the event status. You know, has it been rescheduled? Has it been canceled? Mm -hmm. um, and attendance mode. And uh, that can be, uh, you know, online, offline or mixed. And I think that um, those are really hard bits of information to get from a Web page. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So part of the tools that we're, we're, we're bringing into this effort, such as Footlight, help uh, a person who's main um, goal is to display the information on the website to be able to review uh, yeah. those information pieces so that they're accurate uh, before they get converted to RDF. Yeah, and I, I really wish that I knew um, a lot of people that worked in the food truck industry because as you're talking, I'm thinking, I'm always trying to figure out where my favorite food truck is and it's so difficult to track them down. <laughs> Having something like this is an app. If anyone's watching, please make that because I would yeah. use it. <laughs> and we already have a beautiful model here that's very similar to what they would need. What's the end result? You know, so people are now going to hopefully be able to use this data. What are they using it to do? Do you have some examples to show us? One thing is if there are any graphic designers out there that are interested in user experience or designing, you know, uh, user interfaces, that that we could uh, definitely help have help okay, with. There's a lot of people that watch that do that. So shout out to those folks to, to hit you up if they're interested. Uh, this is an output that yeah. um, shows the performances of an artist, Louis-Jean Cormier. And to get this list of events, uh, we basically combined uh, five data sets and one of the challenges, because it's performing arts, is that things change. And uh, we have the goal of updating this daily. Mm -hmm. So to see the, the websites uh, that were used for this aggregate view, uh, you can see the five websites uh, down here. And some of these websites are actively working with us, mm. um, such as SPEC, uh, to review the information using Footlight before it gets converted. So by involving you know, different uh, people with different skill sets in the community, we believe we can get to a high quality data. Yeah, that's good. I think that because you are not necessarily releasing all of this data to just anybody, right? Uh, you know, I know that is the definition of open, but right now you are really focusing on folks that have a real invested interest in making this data quality so that that can be like the baseline and you know potentially once you guys grow and you're out in 2023 and so many people are using this um potentially there's like some machine learning and other things that you can do for for some of that data quality based on this good foundation that you're establishing now exactly so another potential use of of the uh, knowledge graph is knowledge cards and you may be familiar with the google knowledge yeah. card yeah now one of the challenges uh, when using knowledge cards is, well, this is great, but it's not exactly what I need for my website um, in terms of the information. Or I, I may know that there is a different set of photographs available somewhere else in his mm -hmm. media kit. Yeah. And how we're working on a feature to be able to allow the data consumers to configure uh, the knowledge cards. That's amazing. So basically, the, the knowledge card was created by merging different data sets. And <clears throat> we basically uh, rank these different graphs so that the knowledge card it gets the uh, merged data from the highest ranked graph. What um, 
we allow you to do as a consumer of arts data is rearrange the ranking to, to suit your needs. So by controlling the rank here, you can select the data sources uh, that suit your needs. And I, I do love this plug and play kind of mentality on this because you're you're right, like depending on what you're using this data for, you might, so for instance, the, the, the um, use case that I just mentioned, a um, academic library wants to have these, these knowledge cards. They probably don't need to know um, where this performer is going to be in Canada if they are in Iowa <laughs> in the United States. So maybe not put that data on. And, and, and then, yeah, that's the key because the community has uh, knowledge and skills and putting that back in their hands really allows them to reuse the data. Whereas if it's missing something, you know, today, like Wikidata doesn't have a picture, then I, I start to just, okay, I'll create my own database. And then it goes down the path of multiple databases that are not connected. What we're trying to do is allow people to configure and have some control of the data and if there's something missing, you know, they can create a derived data set. And all we ask is that you add it back afterwards. <laughs> Re, uh, it's almost like re, uh, rewind, be kind. Like, okay, reuse, be kind. Uh, That's a good one, yeah. um, all right, so tell us a little bit about um, some of the specs on the knowledge graph. So we're using GraphDB. Um, we have, in terms of explicit triples, uh, not that much. I'd say about half a million, mm -hmm. um, but because of our approach of upcoming events and refreshing that data, we refresh about two million triples every month or more. Wow. So, yeah. so there's a constant update happening uh, yeah. with with the data. So it's really alive and and it's active. Um, and one of the um, core pieces I would say of the of the platform is something we call the Arts Data Data Bus which is uh, very similar to the DBpedia data bus. Mm -hmm. um, and if I could just play this. Mm -hmm. so, so the idea of the Arts Data data bus is we want anyone to be able to share their cultural data sets. Mm -hmm. So the data bus captures metadata on a data set and mm -hmm. versions it so that uh, we have um, a, a bit more like software development. We have version data sets that can be used and recombined in different ways. And the uh, concern that's often raised is, well, you know, how good is my data and, and yeah. how much does it, does it match the, the, the data model, the core data model around events? So part of the data bus is to provide Shackle reports at different levels of data maturity so that mm -hmm. people can contribute and also see what is missing or what is wrong with uh, the data model or some of the properties they're using so that they can align it better with the core data model. Yeah, and nice. I guess, unlike a data lake or a data warehouse, we are trying to stay connected to that core data model, which mm -hmm. makes everything afterwards a lot easier in terms oh, of yeah. connecting the data together. And of course, when we um, have reuse, and we have data sets that may be initially just an Excel file or you know, a, yeah. a CSV file. And then someone in the community who has a different set of skills could convert that to RDF and then republish that back to the data bus. Mm -hmm. Then the provenance becomes super important uh, in yeah. terms of you know, making sure that someone is, is, is uh, uh, we're keeping track of where the data is coming from and how it's being transformed. Yeah, and and that's a big trust factor too, right? It I mean, is. if if you uh, are allowing others to meddle in your own data, um, or you're trying to use somebody else's data, you want to be able to trust who was working on it, what did they do, um, you know, what what were the previous versions? If you need to do a rollback. All right, Gregory. So, I, I mean, this has been fabulous. I'm so glad that we had a time, you know, the time to to go into this. I see you have a lot of supporters already. Um, maybe you'll even find some more after this video goes out. Who knows? Um, we can always hope. Um, yeah. I certainly am always going to be uh, checking in to see what you guys are doing because I think it's it's really fabulous work. Uh, so if folks want to uh, get involved or even contact you for some information, how would they go about doing that? Well, I would say the best way would be to to visit our website at culturecreates.com. So you can reach our emails and uh, reach one of us uh, through the website.